Can somebody please do me a solid and call in a bomb threat on the Premier League season? I've just had enough. Chelsea travel not too far to Craven Cottage and lose 2-1 to Fulham. Let's get into it. And blue is the colour! Essien! Drop That could be the championship! Greetings! Welcome back to Couch Critic with me, Dennis P. For what is your Chelsea match review, but more specifically a tactical synopsis of Chelsea's performance against Fulham. But before I get into any of that, please do me a favor, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification button to keep up with the latest and the newest. And, of course, just to let you know, it does help me with the algorithm. The more people that like this stuff, the more it attaches to the algorithm and allows for more people to see the content. It will help me. I'm going to help my sponsor, who go by the name of Major League Socks. And fellas, if you ever want to walk in the footsteps of greatness, you know what to do. Hit them up. The link will be in the description. Strap yourselves in, because this is going to be a long one. Just an abysmal performance in a London derby against Fulham, you know. Just the culmination of problems on the pitch, off the pitch, you know, poor summer planning, all of these things cum culminating to a very, very disappointing performance against Fulham at Craven Cottage. And I'm just going to get right into it. We're going to be looking at Kovacic, who I feel like has not gotten as much of the ire from the Chelsea supporters that I feel he deserves. He's been poor, and we're going to get into the reasons why I feel that way. We're going to look at the debut of Yao Felix, what I liked, what I didn't like, the reasons why Chelsea brought him in the first place, whether or not those, those issues still persist with our attack when he's in the side. We're going to be looking at the summer window and the problems that persist there. And we're also going to be looking at, you know, off the pitch. We're going to have to look at our physios right now. Like, guys are just dropping like flies. So like I said, this is going to be a long video, so strap yourselves in. Let's get right into it. Now, many of you know that I just love midfield. I love that aspect of the game. I feel like it culminates on everything. You know, you have to be very good technically. You have to be very good offensively. You have to be very good defensively. And, you know, just moving the ball and whatnot. So, you know, the, the nucleus of the team is always going to be centered around the midfield for me. And when you have a poor midfield, you have a poor game. And today, man, we didn't see we didn't see much from our midfield that gave us any confidence going forward. Um, I was very, very disappointed in particular with Kovacic. I thought that he was just horrific and has been for quite some time now. Like we're talking about a guy that is very much, you know, wants to get on the ball, demands the ball, you know, a guy that when he gets on it is very good with his touches, you know, dribble pass, you know, move it quickly and, you know, just advance the ball, a shuttler that can get it into the final third and <laughs> you'd be you'd be hard pressed to find one instance in this game against Fulham where he did anything that resembled, you know, Kovacic of, you know, even 2018, you know, Kovacic um, in 2019 even and it's so frustrating. And beyond that, like his defensive awareness has just gotten so, so poor in, in recent years, in recent months. And a lot of what we saw today, everyone's blaming Koulibaly for his, you know, his lack of form and like his inability to like really assess what's happening. But a lot of that has to do with his connection with the midfield. I think that Koulibaly had a rough time playing with Kovacic. Kovacic was just letting runners run off of him time and time again, gave Koulibaly one and two things that he needed to deal with at the same time. Didn't really do it very well, but at the same time, he's putting an immense amount of pressure because he had absolutely nobody in the midfield that was like coping with runners coming in. You know, so he had two, he was 1v2 more often than not. I'm speaking of Koulibaly. And, you know, for the most part, we just got no resistance from the midfield before we got into our three center backs. Um, the problems don't end there though. Like. Kovacic in form is a guy that you want to see on the ball. He's a guy that you want to see demand the ball. Not once in this game did I see him move into positions where he could collect the ball and be effective. It's just, it was just so porous. Like to see him, you know, we're playing out from the back. Obviously, we're, we weren't very good at it today. We often went long because we had no ability to play into the midfield. Again, down to Kovacic and Zakaria, just not being very good that way. And you just, every time you wanted him to demand the ball, get into areas where he can get on the ball, you know, he was just non-existent. So the problems are tenfold with him. It's not just the defensive awareness. It's not just the fact that he's not using his movement to position himself to get on the ball. It's also his passing accuracy, his ability to release the ball into space and get guys into good areas to score goals. 
everything today was just abysmal, abysmal. And like, you just can't justify seeing that sort of a performance from Kovacic, which is not the first time we've seen it, to be honest. Like, this has happened time and time again, especially after the World Cup. And, and and not address it. Like, these are real, real issues. When people talk about, like, you know, really revolutionizing the midfield and whatnot, I don't think that it stops with, you know, bringing in, you know, so a replacement for Jorginho and, you know, potentially bringing in a replacement for, for Conte. I think it actually goes to Kovacic as well. Like, he doesn't really provide the things that we need from a midfield three. You know, yes, he's a decent shuttler when he's on his game, but in the final third, he provides absolutely nothing. When in possession and we're looking for that incisive pass to get somebody in behind, he does not release the ball correctly, does not release it with the accuracy that we need to be incisive and cutting edge in the final third. So there's a lot of things that like you look at in his game that you expect, you know, he will naturally do because, you know, he's so nice on the ball and like, you know, he just has this like this this ability about him that you 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 see and you think that this is just a second nature thing. but. When you actually analyze his game, which is what I did today, there are a lot of things that are left to be desired in his actual actual overall package. And for that reason, I think that Chelsea need uh, to revolutionize the midfield beyond, you know, Jorginho, beyond potentially Conte, and also look at Kovacic and whether or not he's providing the types of things that you need to be a you know a real cohesive sound midfield. Now, I am going to get into the Yao Felix, but before I do that, I want to address some of the things that I'm seeing happening, you know, even at the board level, you know, the mistakes that were made in the summer and address that in a real way, because I think that that has now led to part of the reason why a lot of the supporters were just turning their noses up to Yao Felix and whatnot. They just don't trust the decision making at the highest level at this club. And I mean, do you blame them really? Like, obviously, they're, they're mitigating factors, and I think we have to address that first. Obviously, last year, the beginning of the summer, we had a really, really hard time just getting the ownership group in, in time to, you know, address some of the, the issues that we had. Obviously, a lot of outgoing players and, you know, essentially what they had to do is basically just find players that can, you know, at least, you know, mask over some of the holes that we had, like the loss of Christensen, the loss of... Uh, of uh, Rudiger, obviously Lukaku was on his way out. Um, they were looking for another. Ziyech was looking for a home. So all these things were problems that needed to be papered over before we could even address, you know, improving the squad that was horrific towards the end of the season. Like these were just like stop gaps to at least like paper over the cracks that are existed in the squad. And so coming in as a new ownership group, there was a lot of things that needed to be taken care of in a really, really short amount of time. And, you know, some of the decisions were poor, you know, Cucurella at 65 million, I know you guys heard me spoke on it before, you know, that was a massive overpay. And of course we needed to get him in because we were losing, you know, Alonzo and we needed somebody to come in for Chilwell because we weren't sure if he was gonna be able to bounce back from injury well and clearly he hasn't. But, you know, it's just still a massive overpay and it's proven to be a problem right now. Obviously with Koulibaly, he's certainly not, you know, adjusted to the pace of the Premier League very well and he's proving to be a poor signing. You know, just in terms of assessing what was needed uh, in that left center back position, whether or not he's been able to deliver it has been, you know, at best, you know, questionable at best. And, you know, he just hasn't provided us with the leadership that I thought he would. And he hasn't really given us the quality on the ball. It seems like the pace of the game is like forcing him into decisions that he would normally not make. Uh, when he's in Italy, uh, even when he's playing for Senegal. So, again, another problem there, you know. And, you know, Fofana, obviously, you know, it's it's a difficult thing when, you know, you buy somebody for the exorbitant amount that we paid and then he gets injured maybe one and a half games in. It's very hard to assess what you got. But, again, he was coming off of injury as well. So, you know, there's reason there to, again, doubt the, you know, the brain trust. And, again, it goes beyond that. Like, let's not forget that the decision to sack Thomas Tuchel, who they bought most of these players for, you know, Aubameyang being another one that I don't even want to get into. Like, we all understand that that was a support, support signing. You know, a lot of these things culminate on the fact that, like, they took the decision to sack Thomas Tuchel after backing him to the amount of, I don't know, 300 million pounds, somewhere in and around there at least. And, you know, you don't even give him the, the time to, you know, acclimatize to his new team you know, before you take the decision to bring in Graham Potter. And now, after you've spent 
an exorbitant amount of money to back Thomas Tuchel. You sack him, you bring in Graham Potter, and clearly he's not able to address some of the, the issues that we have in the side right now. And, you know, all of this right now just means that we had a lot of work to do in the summer. It was rash decision after rash decision, and not much we could have done about that. But at the same time, a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now are manifest, have manifest from the fact that we haven't really assessed what we did in the summer very well. Now, in the case of Yao Felix, um, I understand why a lot of the supporters are turning their noses up to this particular signing. You know, first it was because, you know, well, we, it's not a need in the squad. And, uh, you know, I wonder if it had more to do with just the overall negativity around the, the club. You know, the fact that we know that we need a right back, the fact that we know that we need at least two center backs or center, center mids right now. And, you know, a, a signing like Yao Felix is often overlooked because there's so many glaring holes in the side. But for me, I just look at it and I'm like, how can you turn down a player of his quality, his pedigree? How can you not see that what he provides on the pitch is precisely one of the things that is missing from the Chelsea setup right now? I mean, yeah, he, he plays shadow striker and, you know, we have a few that play in that role, but their deployment, their, their ability to play that role well their ability to use their technique to get into excellent areas, use their pace, their movement, you know, the, the ability to play in the half spaces, you know, their vision to find uh, to find men in, in space and whatnot, like to make runs off the ball, like all of these things, like just the technique, the technical aspect that you need to play in the Premier League, you know, be touch tight, be, 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 be technically sound is something that we don't have in any one of our attackers right now. None of them, like none of them have the technical ability to unlock teams in the final third, the technical ability to play in tight spaces, to, you know, move the ball quickly and accurately. Like all of these things were things that we saw from Yao Felix in 58 minutes of time. It was evident to me that what he provided in that 58 minutes was sorely lacking for I don't know how long now. We just haven't had anyone of that quality on the ball to you know really really threaten the, the defense and put them you know get have them guessing about what the next action is and you know it, it's a shame that like he, he's he's gone now for three three games and you know we only really saw 58 minutes of him because truly you know now it's an expensive loan and that expensive loan is only going to be compounded it's really expensive now because he's missing the next three games on top of that we're not going to see him for another month he is everything i want in a chelsea attacker you know in terms of like a number 10 a guy that like this is what i like to see in attackers guys that are really really technically sound guys that have intelligence on the ball you know the only thing that i think that was lacking today was his finishing ability and i, I feel like He's he's better than he showed today. Like he had a couple really good opportunities um, to really strike the ball and you know just pick a corner and he probably would have scored. But most of his attempts at goal went right into the keeper and you know he hit it with the right sort of pace, which means that he's timing his runs well and you know like the ball stayed hit, which I like to see as well. But for the most part, like the accuracy, the ability to pick a corner wasn't there, which is something I think that he has in his locker, but just hasn't shown it enough in the last little while for it to be relied upon going forward. But everything else, you know, technical ability, as I said, the pace, you know, the ability to assess what's happening in the midfield and move the ball quickly, understanding that the buildups in the Premier League have to be, you have to build, you have to move the ball quickly. You know, like there's no dwelling on the ball. There's no laissez-faire approach to playing you know, football in the Premier League. And it's it's a wonder that somebody like Kai Havertz hasn't picked that up yet. He hasn't realized that he doesn't have the time on the ball. Or maybe he just doesn't have the technique to move the ball quickly enough. But, you know, these are the types of things that Yao Felix has picked up instantly. He knows that he has to move the ball in the, into the, the dangerous areas quickly. When, when you're in the final third, the game speeds up and your speed of thought has to be match the speed of the game. And if it doesn't, you get caught in position, you turn it over, you you know, wayward pass here and there. And I just don't see that with Yao Felix. I think that he is a quality, quality footballer. And he's a guy that if we can surround him, like I know he's only here on loan, but we can, if we can surround him with people that can make runs off the ball, like a la, you know, somebody like Raheem Sterling maybe, you know, if we can provide him with somebody that can actually extend the pitch a little bit more, a la, you know, Reese James on the right, I think he's going to be a fantastic player for us because there are instances in this game where, 
you know, he's breaking. Obviously, his turns were incredible. I, I know a few of you guys saw his turns on the, on that left flank there. And as you can see here, he draws so many people to the ball. Like, there's three people that are now trying to converge here on Yao Felix. And, you know, that just opens up so much space for Mason Mount, who he, he lays it off to. And unfortunately, you know, we'll get into it, but, like, the decision-making by players not named Yao Felix today was just horrific. Just horrific like what sense does it make for you to be in possession with acres of space in and around you and you know you see Yao Felix here advancing into the final third all you got to do is play it into space there and he's in you know the decision to lay it off to Aspilicueta here is just poor you know and you know you guys have heard me bang on about decision making time and time and time again and this is exactly what I mean it doesn't just stop at Mason Mount it also extends to Kai Havertz in, in situations in this game as well you know like you know, you're, you're breaking into space here. Like, you have a runner that's in, advanced in front of you. You have the time on the ball. Pick your head up and look. Survey the pitch. You know, he makes a decision to, to continue his run instead of releasing, uh, you know, uh, Yao Felix into space where he's 1v1. And it, it, these decisions to me just, just don't make any sense. If, if you are a, a, a forward-thinking, attack-minded attack player, these things should be innate. Like, you should be seeing the space in front of you and utilizing it to play somebody into a better position. Instead, you know, he dribbles and then loses control of the ball and it goes out of bounds. Like, I don't even want to speak about his technique because I've said about it before. I don't think that his touch is very as sound as people think it is. And he's been proving that the last two or three matches that I've seen him play. Like, the ball just running off of him and stuff like that. But, you know, I'll leave that alone for now. I'm just talking specifically about the decision making on the ball. You know, when you have time and space to make the decisions, can you make the right accurate decisions? And once again, he's proven that he can't. Um, and it's it's become problematic for me. It's to the point where I just can't, I can't sugarcoat it anymore. He doesn't provide the things that I want in a number 10, in an attacker, in this Chelsea setup. It's just that simple. Now, those few images are just one of many that I saw today where Chelsea, you know, were breaking into space and just the wrong decisions were made on the ball. Everyone not named, you know, Yao Felix, um, when they got into space, just were horrific and just made the wrong decision time and time again. And, you know, I really like, I really think that, you know, this problem is, again, just coming down to like Chelsea in transition, Chelsea on the counter attack, have not worked out exactly what they want to do yet, you know, and maybe that falls to Grand Potter, but it also just falls on the decision making again of these players, man. I mean, <clears throat> The first action of the game where we saw Yao Felix show his brilliance is when he, you know, he gets down the right flank and, you know, he dribbles past the defender and then he plays it into accurately, perfectly accurately into Kai Havertz. And if I'm not mistaken, Kai Havertz is left footed, right? So for me, I just don't understand why he makes the decision there to try and strike it with his right the first time. Like, what, what, is, what are you trying to achieve? Like, the ball runs across you, you hit it with your left. That's a better chance of scoring the goal than trying to, you know, hit it with your right um, when it's coming in from the right. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Why doesn't he just let it run, roll past his body? You know, like, these, this is just the mark of a player that just doesn't really think the game well enough in the final third. You know, I don't know what his strengths are. I really do not know what his strengths are. And... When you see him in open in the open field and he's running at teams and where you think that this is where you know he excels and stuff like that, he's still making the wrong decisions. You know, like so holistically, this this Chelsea's team have struggled in a multitude of ways. Obviously, the midfield gave us nothing today, absolutely nothing today. When you think of a Zakaria and Kovacic, they just were not giving us enough in the buildup. But even beyond that, because we played a little bit more direct, because we had no midfield, you know, when we worked it into to, uh, to Yao Felix and he was looking to play the flicks and then you run off, like the recognition from the, the receivers was just so languid and poor and just everything that you don't want to see in a Chelsea side when, you know, breaking with pace, you know. I'm disappointed. I'm frustrated. I think that these problems are things that can be solved with more quality on the pitch. Obviously, we don't have a full complement of players. And that brings us to the next point of this whole discussion. And, you know, there's a lot of people right now that are on the Grand Potter out train. And, you know, they were never really Grand Potter in. And, you know, this run of results where we haven't been able to win anything 
have only escalated their want for him out of the club, you know, and, you know, I can understand it, but, like, at the same time, like, let's not ignore the fact that we have 10, no, 11 injuries right now, 11 injuries, and you cannot sack a manager based on the fact that he hasn't really figured out what to do with reserve players. You just can't, you know, like, our preferred 11 has not, he's not seen our preferred 11. He's not seen the best Chelsea yet, so I can't really evaluate, you know, what um, what he's like as a manager until I see him with a, not even a full strength squad, but just more quality on the pitch. Like, you know, you can argue that he's probably played people that shouldn't be playing, and you know he's been burned for you know trying different shapes and whatnot when you don't have the personnel to execute it correctly i i would agree with that but you know in terms of seeing the actual quality when whenever we've seen reese james on the pitch it's been a marked difference you know like it's it's night and day so i can't really really fault him right now but where i do hold you know where i do think that the ownership the brain trust have to start to hold account is in the physical department like, this has become alarming. And whether or not it's coincidence or not, this is something that has to be addressed right now. Like, Chelsea have lost a lot of man games. We've lost a lot of important players. And as they've come back, they've gone injured again. And to me, you know, I'm talking about Conte. I'm talking about Fafana. I'm talking about Reese Jane. I'm talking about, like, you know, the bedrock of this Chelsea team right now cannot stay fit. And... Yeah, I know we, we basically cleaned out our entire like physio, our doctors and whatnot since the, the merge or the, the takeover and it's proving to be a real, real problem. You have to ask questions about the physio team. So before I get, I lay into like Graham Potter and lay into his lack of tactical awareness, lay into, you know, his, you know, his laissez-faire approach on the sidelines. I think we need to make an example of that physio team, like because the fact that we have 11 injuries right now to key players is an indictment on their work, first and foremost. And if we need to see, and I, I really do feel like right now, Chelsea fans, myself included, are asking for blood. I just don't know if the blood is on the hands of Graham Potter. It needs to be directed somewhere else for now. And for me, it's the physio department. We have to address this right now. This is insane. Every time we get somebody healthy, they go down injured. Every time we feel like we're, we're starting to find some sort of like cohesiveness, some sort of like semblance of like form, you know, somebody gets injured. I don't know, but I really do feel like if there's blood to be had right now, it has to start there because there's just been way too many injuries and false assessments of players that, you know, come, into, come back into the squad and then go right back out to injury again. But I do think I'm gonna wrap it up there, guys. Sorry if I went on a bit of a rant and it's kind of carried on a little bit too long, but there's just things that I just can't ignore anymore. You know, the quality in this Chelsea side is just so poor and the investment that we've made to bring in quality, quality players has just been improperly assessed. Like from Kai Havertz to Koulibaly to Kukurella, I can go on and on. It's just, it's crazy. Obama Young, another one, you know, Raheem Sterling hasn't really been great. And the one guy that we brought in, the two guys that we brought in on loan are the only real shining lights that we see right now in terms of Yao Felix. Gutted that he's gonna be gone again for another three three games. Like, oh man, like when it rains, it pours at Chelsea, man. Like we just cannot catch a break. You know, cannot catch a break. Surefire red, 100% deserved. Um, way too high on that challenge and got nowhere near the ball. So rightfully sent off, but you know, just when I started seeing glimpses of what I want to see from attackers, he goes, right? So here we are, guys, you know, like another, after another game, we're here and left wondering, where are we as a football club? How do we get out of this? And is it going to be addressed in the transfer window? Like, you cannot make any more arguments about the fact that, you know, we have to, that we have to address the, the needs right now in the squad right now. It's dire that we find somebody can play on that right side of the pitch. Everything that happened down the right side of the flank, the right side of the pitch today was horrific, just awful. Like nothing stuck. You know, Trevor Choloba, I don't want to hear anyone talk about why he's not playing anymore. I think it was evidence today why he's not playing. He's just not very focused all the time. Like his concentration is poor. It doesn't always lead to goals, but it certainly leads to putting this team under an immense amount of pressure. And between him and Aspilicueta on that right flank right now, it was just two players that just 
did not look comfortable in, on the pitch and you know a lot of the, the the threatening attacking moves that you know Fulham were e able to put together a la Willie and were just down to those two being just so poor you know just so poor and we can't ignore that anymore we need somebody in that right back right wing back position that we can depend on uh, in situations where we can't get Reese James in Man, I, I know it's a tough call because you're not going to be able to get somebody of Reese James quality and players that, you know, warrant starting minutes are not going to want to come and be a deputy to Reese James, regardless of whether or not you think that he's injury prone or whatever. Like, they can play somewhere else and play, you know, the lion's share of the games, you know. And you can't go somewhere thinking that, well, this guy is injury prone, so I might get minutes. It just doesn't make sense. Like, that's not a sound sound like business move in terms of like a football footballer who has you know limited time to you know advance their career so i think that what chelsea need to do is find somebody who's in in advanced stages of their career you know still quality obviously 28 29 years old that need a payday you know just somebody of that sort because i've been hearing pedro poro i don't think he's coming to chelsea guys i'm not gonna lie to you i don't think that's gonna happen you know perhaps juranovic but he's been linked with a, a club in in italy right now and I don't know, but there's got to be somebody else. You know, I, I think that we need another sort of like Luis, uh, Luis signing that we made a, a couple of years back under Jose. Like somebody of that sort, I think would be perfect for the situation that we're in right now. But guys, I, I don't know where to go with this, man. I'm at wit's end. I don't know what else to say. I don't know what the solutions are. We have to go back in the transfer window. That much is evident right now. And whether or not we have the stomach to overpay again just to address the needs. I don't know, but we have to do it. Like, it seems like that's become more of what is on, on offer right now than, you know, just trying to find these diamonds in the rough right now. We have a gaping hole in the squad that needs fixing and it's not gonna happen overnight. But until then, keep the blue flag flying high and up the chels. Peace.